good morning good afternoon and good evening a very warm welcome is that all right so a very warm welcome to all the esteemed good when you're not speaking yeah so the realization of the cost of inaction propels action with this thought in mind i'm very excited to chair a panel of highly accomplished women dr sam collins anushala adinuka marcia dyson prachi kale susan calendar as a leadership consultant eq coach I work on culture change projects with various organizations. I especially enjoy working with women leaders and help them break the cultural, structural, organizational and personal barriers. Gender inequality is indeed a complex of moral, social and economic issue. As with the World Economic Forum's latest projection based on the current trends into the future, the overall global gender gap we close in 99.5 years on average across the 107 countries covered in the report lack of progress in closing the economic participation and opportunity gap leads to an extension of the time it will be needed to close this gap at the slow speed experienced over the period of 2006 to 2020 it will take 257 years to close this gap covid-19 crisis has further exasperated the situation it has left many employees struggling to do their jobs many feel they are always on now that the boundaries between work and home have blurred people are worried about their family's health and finances burnout is a real issue women in particular have been negatively impacted one would have thought that covid-19 pandemic has created a silver lining for women and caregivers as many are now able to juggle between the household responsibilities while working from home but the fact is the women across the globe are quitting as per women in workplace 2020 report by mackinson and leenan one in four women are downsizing their careers or leaving the workforce especially women of color are more likely to have been laid off or furloughed during covid-19 crisis stalling their careers and jeopardizing the financial security pandemic has also intensified challenges that women already face in workplace working mothers have always worked double shift a full day of work followed by hours spent caring for children and doing household labor we have made slow but steady progress however over the past 6 years the crisis could erase all the gains that we've made women comprise almost half of the us workforce and thus could make a large economic impact by taking off work in one year women working for a pay for pay in united states are more than japan's entire gdp given that working women contribute nearly 8 trillion to the annual gdp this clearly a compelling case for doing more to help women stay in workforce through this pandemic if all paid working women in united states took a day off it could cost the country almost 21 billion in terms of gdp the in the age of automation and on near horizon artificial intelligence uh offer new job opportunities and avenues or economic advancement but women face new challenges above the long established ones between 40 million to 160 million women globally may need to transition between occupations by 2030 often into higher skilled roles long established barriers will make it harder for women to make these transitions they have less time to reskill or search or um, for employment because they spent much more time than men on unpaid care work they are less mobile due to physical safety infrastructure and legal challenges and have lower access to digital technology and participation in stem fields than men women are half of the globe's population but yield only a third of the gdp today we will discuss how to pivot the whole workforce top to bottom and achieve gender and other diversity measures 
what new mindset is needed i have extremely qualified uh, accomplished uh, uh, panelists on board with me today and i would like to invite them to begin with their introductory comments and kindly take rounds to introduce themselves i would like to begin with sam collins well hi everyone and thank you for having me today it's my pleasure to be here so i'm sam collins and i'm a women's equality advocate author and coach and i'm founder of an organization that i started when i thought i was really really old when i was 29 and about to turn 30 and now I'm 49 about to turn 50 so I realized I wasn't actually quite so old at the time I found it as fire for equality then so I've been working in this area for well do the maths just over 20 years and I love it I wouldn't do anything else I think that as despite the negative picture that we see across the globe and that has just been starkly explained to us i am a very strong believer in the power and potential of women and all that we can achieve and all that we are we have already achieved and all that we can do so i have a positive optimistic uh, view of the future which uh, i'll share a little bit more about shortly uh i'd like to invite prachi next Hi, good evening, good afternoon, good morning everyone. Um it's a pleasure to contribute to this panel. Um I'm Prachi Kale and uh, I'm an uh, I describe myself as an expert journalist with a with a love for curiosity and learning. Uh my career has spanned several years across different areas, um bioinformatics applied to HIV research, um and ironically doing PCR tests multiple years ago. uh management consulting um i've i've overseen her million dollars of investments in cybersecurity strategy uh and about 2 to 1/2 years ago i coalesced all of my my um experiences in these areas of business science and tech and uh i applied it now i'm applying it now to uh diversity inclusion and corporate responsibility at my firm um in addition to that um i'm also a professional coach to entrepreneurs and uh corporate professionals uh, especially gen z and millennials um women of all backgrounds um and i'm helping them navigate the knowns and unknowns that come you know with the endeavors and much like sam said i'm 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 optimistic right the power of women um you know to come together and solve problems in in a more collaborative manner so um that's what that's what absolutely inspires me to do this work every day uh i would like now like to invite olushola to introduce herself and make her initial remarks uh kindly unmute yourself olushola we can't hear you <laughs> can't hear you okay can you hear me now absolutely okay, excellent um i'd like to thank uh, frank uh, the chairperson of um uh, this um conference horaries and i also like to thank you pretty for for putting this um, panel together uh, my name is olushola denuga i'm founder and mp uh, ceo of uh, ola system which is an it company uh, in nigeria uh, we mainly service financial institutions and telecom here uh, we're partners to oracle um with ola system i've been able to um uh gotten quite a number of award from oracle over the years we pioneered um cloud services in this region um well my background is um, i have a first degree in computer science and um, combined honors with economics and masters in finance over the years uh, i was in banking as cio of various banks and uh, thereafter that's over for over 20 years and then thereafter founded um all our systems which have been the md for the past um, 14 years uh, i think i will talk more when um the more the questions and uh, share my experience so far in being in a man's um, field thank you thanks a lot for the wonderful introduction sam colin uh, prati and all of you i would like to now invite marcia for her initial comments and introduction Okay first uh Pretty thank you very much for gathering us together and hello ladies uh good day good evening good afternoon wherever you are in the world my name is Marcia L Dyson uh the founder of Women's Global Institute it was formerly Women's Global Initiative our tagline is 
purposeful and profitable social engagement after working many years for nonprofits. I knew that nonprofit sometimes was not the fastest way to get women, especially out of poverty. So we look at strategic partnerships with women around the world, whether it's for career building or economic development or uh, resourcing uh, or pulling their resources together to do many great things. I too am an optimist. I was the uh, um, chief of staff of Reverend Jackson's International Trade Bureau in 1980. But when I, I was in my 20s, almost 50 years ago, it was the women on the south side of Chicago that got together to bought up the property on the south side of Chicago by the lakefront. We had our own schools, our ice cream shops, and our grocery stores and fish markets. So I believe in the possibility of women because I have to look at myself and not void the capability of the things that I did as a woman who grew up in poverty and whose mother taught us to make a way out of no way. So I'm always optimistic and the power of women, that women can remember that history that we have within us and recognize the women who have done it and led the way for us. I, yeah, I love that passion, absolutely. Um, I would now like to invite Susan Fallender uh, to you know, introduce herself and give her opening remarks. Yes, thank you, and, and really happy to be here with all of you as well, and thank you for, for organizing and for HASIS. Um, so, yeah, so I have worked in the corporate responsibility and social investment field for uh, about two decades now, and and throughout that entire time, and why I'm really excited about this conversation, you know, have gotten to look at gender issues from multiple angles. One from how a large company like Intel um, works uh, for our global workforce on empowering women and also in a, in a tech field, like some of my colleagues here, um, how do we address that even beyond the walls of Intel? Um, I also had the opportunity um, early in my career to work at an investment research firm looking at how companies were progressing on on uh, gender uh, equality. So it's been nice to see what, and we can get to this in the, in the discussion part of how the conversation on the investor side has changed as well as within large companies. And I think what has also uh, just been so important to me in this work is really the stories of the women who I've gotten to meet with in all different uh, types of programs and initiatives. A lot of, we do a lot with our supplier diversity. So women-owned businesses around the world um, and really you know, getting to kind of see what's possible um, when you're opening up and, and reducing some of those barriers uh, for, for opening up that economic opportunity. So really looking forward to the discussion. Thank, thanks a lot, uh, um, Susan, and all of you for some wonderful uh, comments. Um, I would like to now uh, ask, uh, you know, um, come up with the, uh, the first round of questions to all of you. And uh, would like to begin with Sam first. So Sam's uh, women's knowledge, representation, and collective action are powerful resources. The rights, values, and capabilities need to be respected to achieve a just and sustainable future. Women's underrepresentation in different sectors and positions of power have se severe repercussions on families, society, and the economy especially in their own confidence and their ability to make their own personal decisions. You have been working with individuals, communities, and organizations to create the quality and change conditions. So in your opinion, what should be done at the grassroots level to transform the lives of women and enable them to reverse these vulnerabilities and bring a systemic change? Well, uh, thank you for starting with me with such a big question. <laughs> If I can don't give it some kind of decent answer. Um, <laughs> you know, if you combine the collective knowledge and years of experience of, of, of just of us and we came together uh, as we are doing now, I think we would probably solve this in about 10 minutes. The issue becomes, though, I think many of us are out there doing what we do fairly solo. Um, I, I asked a group of women of color recently, what did they think was the biggest issue for women of color? And they said white women. And I thought that really struck me as a way how we have to start to really, initially as women, but broader than that, come together and collaborate with our thinking and ideas is one, uh, one thought. My second one was Marsha and I kind of joked before we started here that, 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 that we all need to go on retreat. And she said, you know, she was saying how burnt out we're all feeling. 
and she said that the world needs to go on retreat. And I think this is really true because there's so much passion that's being ignited in so many different ways right now. But it's getting burnt out by these big, huge issues that we have that are coming at us on a daily basis, be it race, be it gender inequality, be it income inequality, whatever it is. And they are really shadowing everything that we're trying to do and because we're so caught up in them and we want to solve the problem. We see it as a problem that needs to be solved. And as women, we're very good at that. Give me a, give me a problem. Give me 10 problems. I'll go down the list and I'll solve all these problems. But it, actually, it's a game of whack-a-mole. If you're familiar with the game of whack-a-mole, you, you hit something down and then another thing pops up and you hit that down, another thing pops up. And that's essentially what I see is happening with equality. And particularly today, we're talking about gender equality, but gender equality is intersectional with race inequality and income inequality and many, many things. So it's a microcosm for the world. Then we also say, ooh, this is such a big deal. And it's systemic. We hear this all the time. It's systemic. And when we say it's systemic, everyone gets very overwhelmed because, oh my goodness, what does that mean? And now I have to change my organization. I have to change my community. I have to change the world. And we're out there as the lone rangers trying to do all this. Am I hitting home? Anybody? Yes. And it's exhausting. Yet if we look at it differently and we say, well, systemic is actually us as the human being and we start with ourselves, and we look at that and say, how can we as individuals, how can we as women actually really look at this with a different perspective? Um, there's a lot out there about self-care. And I joked with someone recently and said, don't tell me I'm going to have to do something that specializes in self-care because I'm not very good at it myself. But actually, I think that we all are pretty bad at it. And we see it as sort of a dangerous problem that we need to we need to start eating well or sleeping well. But actually, there's so much truth in it that we do need to really start with ourselves as individuals, come back to that, in my opinion. Look at the system of ourselves and our families and our communities. When you talk about grassroots, pretty, that's what I would say. Um, and then that will radiate out. I see so many women, including myself, I would put myself in this group if we want to group people who are out there trying to change everything else and then we're not so focused on ourselves so I'm very much about the inside out approach and coming together as women in community and let me say it as well I think that we just need to have a whole lot more fun with it it's become a extremely serious topic and I don't want to under play how serious it is, but I do think that we need to look at it in a different way with some more lightness. I think it does need to be a whole lot more retreat, Marsha, with a whole lot more good food and a whole lot more thinking and a whole lot more looking after ourselves so that we can come up with some new ideas and some new solutions for change. That's my two pennies worth to kick us off. That's really amazing. And the way we said one problem after the other, what all are we going to change? The world, this, you know, the, the organizations, people's thought process, and we need to begin with ourselves first. And, and that's where, because it's so busy looking after everybody that we forget about ourselves. So that was a wonderful statement that you make and made, and and that, um, and 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 I think this uh, will connect uh, with Prachi. You know, I would like to ask you this question: your your experienced talent management strategist, a professional coach to millennials, Gen Z, entrepreneurs, and corporate professionals, and and under these circumstances, when the boundaries between work and home have really blurred. Women have traditionally taken on primary care caregiving uh, duties and they are worst hit during this situation. They are literally burning out. So from your experience, what are the critical challenges that working women are experiencing in growing their careers, especially working mothers? Uh, yeah. What are some key action steps that you know they can take to lead a fulfilling life? You know, um, Preeti, when you sent me this question, I was like, this is such a loaded question with like part A, part B, part C, right? And so, um, you know, and I thought about it. I think I want to I want to pose a question to the audience saying when we're like when these boundaries or these lack of boundaries, I would say, have always existed. I don't think this is something new. I mean, if anything, COVID-19 has made it more evident 
and just exas- exacerbated the situation, right? So this was like a problem we were just waiting for to happen because of, you know, to to Sam's point around the institutions that are in place, it's just us people who created these sy- systemic barriers, systemic hurdles, right? So thank you, Sam, for setting it up so nicely for me. So now I can skip over the points where I said, these are the issues that are going on, right? Um, but, uh, and if you think about it, right, um, if anything, it alleviates the need for any more data-driven conversations really right i'm saying what more do you need to see we need to fix this problem right it's how many years how many generations of women need to do that i mean i sit at the border of you know uh millennial generation and you know the prior gen y generation and it's it's interesting to see both perspectives i coach i coach women who are out of you know two to three years out of college and it's heartbreaking to hear that they're facing the same problems i faced maybe 10 15 years ago and my female mentors faced, you know, several years ago, right? Um, it, they grew to senior levels. And it's just, it's, if we can get ahead of that, just from a generational standpoint, I think stop handing down those, those problems. And mode has been just it's it's been non-stop it's like women are in this you know 360 degree movie and it's been fast forwarded right in 3d so um so yeah so those challenges uh challenges exist and like you you had you know stated some stats around women choosing to downshift their careers um to quit jobs um, and you know being overrepresented in industries that were hit by COVID 19 they just they simply you know were laid off uh, and so, and so the challenges are tremendous, right? I mean, it puts their financial security at risk. It puts their physical security at risk. Um, in in our organization, uh, we're making sure um, you know this concept of work life balance is shifts to work life integration. Like, do whatever it takes to keep yourself mentally and physically, you know, in a good space, which is extremely hard to do, right? And for me, the biggest uh, part of this equation that is often missed is bringing men into the into the equation. Um, you know, in a corporate workplace, having the concept of sponsorship extremely important, right? Is is, is very very important. And then the concept of sponsorship, in, in in a very simple terms, is having men with political influence. It's you know, who are senior leaders in the organization are speaking for these women for their you know growth, their advancement. Um, when they're not in the room, right? I mean, women are almost over mentored and under sponsored, right? Um, and how are you making sure, you know, the biases that go into the decision making of hiring women and uh, advancing women to senior positions um, are being addressed, right? I mean, those are rampant. I don't think I need to, pre- you know, present any stats around those um, those biases that exist. Um, and then, you know, around uh, pay equity, right? Just making sure your your salaries or, you know, the, the your your remuneration is commensurate to your experience. It doesn't matter if you're female, male, you know, gender, you know, gender fluid, non, you know, whatever those categories are these days, it just doesn't matter. And I think that is a that is a huge one. And and from a working mom standpoint, um, and I, I sort of presented that for women of all backgrounds, right? And from working mom standpoint, um, I have a client who is a um, woman of color. She is in her late 40s. She's a mother of three, single, uh, in their late teens and one with special needs. And they have been staying with her through this entire pandemic, trying to manage this whole thing going through, right? And so there are some good days and bad days, most bad days, but she's, you know, she's powering through it. And, and to Sam's point, right? The changes at the individual level um, really need to step up and do that. I think I teach my clients three big terms. I want, I can't, and I won't. And those are things that are very hard for them to say, right? Um, And and Sam is agreeing with me. I mean, we are problem solvers by nature. We have a hard time letting go and overcoming perfectionist tendencies, right? that even if you're the best person in the world, learn to say you can ask for help, right? Um, that's the main one at the, you know, at, the, at a very individual level. And from a top-down perspective, right, the institutions and practices of our own, if anything COVID-19 has created that slate, really, a blank slate, really, to redraw how we can, how we can you know, rejuvenate our, uh, our practices around work-life balance and advancement.
Thank you. Thank you, Prachi. That was really wonderful. And the, the very fact that I can do it and that the change has to begin with me and the biases that you mentioned that are really very, very prevalent uh, in the system. And 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 it's it's and I've been hearing these stories myself all the time, um, you know, how men also kind of die past us. And then they say, like, you uh, you are your husband is earning. You don't really need the job. You know, you can probably if somebody has to be laid off, it could be probably you know hitting yeah. at a woman instead of a man these the, the labels yeah. expectation stereotyping that i think I, I i miss saying but those are just rampant right and when i said i help navigate these women knowns and unknowns these are just existing, yeah. right and these Absolutely. are some things that systemically will happen once we hit critical mass I know. Thank you so much for bringing that up. And really, now I think um, this uh, would very well connect with Olu Shola. You know, uh, Olu Shola, I've heard your story, the, and like you said, the society's uh, patriarchal nature and the commonly held stereotypical beliefs about female gender present serious concern on a girl plight all over the world. So limit her. They limit their rights, their expectations of themselves. So from your experience, challenges and successes, how can you how can an average young woman overcome barriers of gender stereotypes and succeed in her choice of discipline and endeavor? OK, um, I'll talk from my own point of view and um, um, having to be a woman of color, uh, which has never been a disadvantage to me. You know, let me start with that. Um, I, I, I think I would just mention some few attributes that are quite key. And I think that would help uh, a lot of women, whether colored or not colored. Um, I, I think the first thing is to make sure you are in an area where you have an interest. Uh, it's very key. You, you must be interested in whatever you set out to do. Uh, that helps a lot. And then you you have to be um, you have to continuously improve yourself. Uh, I think that applies to me because I'm in IT. I studied IT, and I'm sure for uh, people that know what IT is like, like 40 years ago, I I, I studied IT late 70s, early uh, 80s. So you can imagine from there to now, I uh, I had to at one point go to India to really upgrade myself and. Um, I think that is very key. And I think the advantage now today uh, with this pandemic is that quite a lot of learning can be done online now. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't like that before, but now it's, to me, I feel it's an advantage. Um, again, going on, self-discipline is quite important, uh, deferring gratification, having to manage your family and uh, also manage career. It's you have to um, remove a little bit of uh, social life in order to really excel. Uh, and I think also strive for excellence, because if you do that, you will stand out. I'm talking about 90s now. Is there a woman that would do this? And um, again, I, I put in my best, and of course, it paid off. And uh, the other counterpart uh, company decided to take uh, me on for their computerization. So, again, I, I think the, uh, the other advice, again, is that women should not quit. Uh, you know, in order to win, you must not be a quitter. It's very, very, very important. Um, and having to move on, you must have a positive attitude, positive in in knowing that um, you you would you can do. I mean, I just remember many years ago, I was trying to change my job. I went for an interview, and um, for CIO of a bank, and it's like, oh, you did very well, but um, we we don't want to take a woman. Uh, again, that's quite discouraging. But again, you just have to um, you know press on and not quit. It's very important. Uh, it, uh, the, 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 it, I think what has helped somebody like me over the years is my belief system. Um, it, that part, I, I like to always say it, you know, having to believe in God Almighty that with him, 
everything is possible has helped my positive attitude towards things. And uh, being in an IT um, environment, as long as I have been, and uh, having to f um, have a, a company that is doing well uh, in this region and also within uh, Africa, we're trying to reach out. I think it's just a mindset. I think, again, women need to, we, we women that are, that we're not many, but I guess by the time we keep trying to mentor other women, younger women, like for example, we have a foundation. Uh, the foundation really is to help women who are interested in going into uh, IT. We need more women at the table. So what I mean is that we need as women also to mentor other women to, you know, join in and knowing that it's really, really possible to achieve whatever you set out to achieve. Uh, I you. think that's it is so very, thank you. That's amazing. Um, it's very important that we don't quit. The pressures yes. will come, um, but the pressures, and it's very nice that you said that uh, being a woman of color never came on your way. But um, the fact is, uh, a lot of women, uh, you know, they do feel that prejudice. Um, you know, the barriers that women feel because of being, the, you know, a woman of color. And, and and I think this is really the apt time to ask Marcia. You know, she is a civil, uh, a civic social activist and a communication specialist. Uh, Marcia, you advocate for gender equality, social justice, and political reform. Now, today, uh, women are coping with a disproportionate impact of COVID-19, especially in the black in black community, and the emotional toll of repeated instances of racial violence that we just witnessed falls heavily on them. So what do you think women of color and minorities should do to support themselves and create a robust support system for each other? First, I want to say in response to some of the other esteemed panelists is that we're at war. I mean, not just the gender war, but war in so many factors of this sort of intersectional lifestyle that we have to have. I remember when it was a burden, I just woke up as a woman and black. You know, I thought that was a heavy lift. But now with all the other things that were pushed upon me to get my head off the pillow, I feel like sometimes I'm kind of like a kaleidoscope and people look to me in my fractured self. But one thing I do realize in talking about fractured women, I, I hear some noise in the background. Uh, but no, to your point, uh, over, I don't want to mess up your name. Sister down here from Africa. Oh, Nisha, you know, Yes, is that, okay. and to what Sam said too, is that women are ready for battle, but we're also fatigued. And one thing that I had to stop, I make sure over 2,500 women in communications through an organization called Color Com. These are women who have seats of power within corporations, but a lot of them are entrepreneurs. But the one thing that I did witness is in, in my work with the military is that no general, if they expect to win, will put out a wounded warrior. And when I say wounded, I mean the tiredness that we feel that we're in. And to your point, Prabhi, I think you're over here, the young lady, I think you're the youngest one here on this panel, is that, you know, you talk about how we have to feel like we have to continue to run the race. Uh, we've been used to running relays, but we've now found ourselves running a continuous marathon, which is exhausting without the benefit of a pit stop. But there's something that we have to do. We have to take care of ourselves. But as I stated in the beginning uh, of this session is that for a black woman and even for all women, you know, when we really look at women in history, we are basically now in what anybody who lives have lived on this earth in a survival mode. It is a time for the survival of the fittest in so many ways, right? We don't have time, you know, we want to cry, but I, I cry all the time. I cry like, what's going to happen to my grandchildren? What's going on now? It's not just me concerned about women. I have grandchildren aged 13, 11, and 9. And so I ask God, because I'm 70 this year, Lord, just let me hold on for another decade because I have to make sure that I have something of legacy behind them, even though I know their parents can do, but I feel as a grandparent, that what is my legacy going to be for them? Because as children of color, as black boys and a black girl, what will the wealth deficit be 
for them. So now I got this burden, which this is supposed to be my golden years, right? But it can't be. You know, only thing I can have going in is have the opportunity to have collaboration with women like yourself uh, and with younger women. I do inter, uh, generational cons uh, consolidations right now, for example, what the women are doing for the uplift of themselves. We're buying land, right? We'll take advantage of what the development platforms are with the new secretary of, of, of HUD and with the new secretary of, of agriculture, go back and create economic development, whether it's farming, whether it's owning land, whether it's buying buildings, so we can find ways. And one thing that really made me sort of hopeful and helpful to young, young women, I'm finding too, is that those survival skills have kicked in and the cottage industries of the 80s and 90s are reviving themselves, right? Uh, we're not, of course, being Mark Zuckerberg, because uh, the only IT I have, ladies and check, is I be tired. I'm like, I tired. But, but I see that, and, and I'm hopeful. And even when we look at the race situation that's happening now uh, with the attack on the Asian community here, I think that it's the women who have stood up mostly the social activists to help combat that. But when it comes to economic development, I think that we can utilize some of the role models that we have not only here because we are in the thousands and the millions, really. They're in the villages, right? They're in the cities of Chicago. They're on the farms that we are kicking in. Once we sit down past the fatigue, which means we do need to have that retreat because when you revitalize you can think, right, Sam? We missed you for a moment there. Yes. That we, I think that that thing within us, that survival thing that we're wired for, regardless of our gender, will either make us or will break us. And I'm hopeful, like the rest of the panelists, that we will be the makers of it all. That's amazing. Thank you so much for those great words. And, and like you said, it's not only about us. It's about creating a future. It's about leaving a legacy. And, and, and um, I think uh, I would like to now approach Susan. Susan, uh, I think you've great, done a great job in that area and you continue to you know, contribute in that space. As a head of corporate uh, responsibility at Intel, you've been working with teams to integrate corporate res responsibility into strategy and policies to create a positive social impact. You also previously led Intel's global programs to empower girls and women through technology. Research indicates that women continue to be underrepresented in science, technology, and engineering, and mathematics. So now, in your opinion, what can organizations do to create gender equality and gender pay equity, especially in tech space? What challenges have you experienced and what inspires you the most about this work? Yeah, no, thank you. And I'll just try to you know, build off of all the really great comments that have been made. And I think a lot of the same threads you know, resonate for me. I think what's important, and I do feel like we're at a really important inflection time right now in terms of how large you know, companies and also smaller companies are thinking about uh, gender equality. I think there was a focus maybe on just about it at a very super superficial level. And I think now we're seeing that there's this um, greater awareness of the need to do kind of, I think, three, th three main things, at least from my experience. One, there is this importance of data. We don't need the data to make the case anymore, but we need the data and transparency to really hold people accountable for making progress. And also looking at the root cause challenges, you know, of where, where you're losing women, um, what do you need to do in terms of different benefits and things to make sure you're really supporting um, people across your workforce. I think the other thing is integration, right? So it's just like with corporate responsibility, it really can't be something separate. It has to be really part of how you do business. And so on a gender equality piece, and we've done this across all of our inclusion work, making sure you're doing inclusive hiring practices and, and leaders are held accountable for doing that, making sure it's in you know, your pr retention and progression, you know, if you're going to get promoted to be VPs, you have to make sure you're demonstrating that you're an inclusive leader. We also actually at Intel have been tying our executive compensation to diversity metrics for several years. So making it just part of how you are doing that and really part of the culture. And that is not something that um, is ever done, but it's kind of continuing to really make sure you're building that. I think the third piece is what you've all talked about. It's the next generation. So one of the things that we've experienced, but we're also seeing this happen with, with other companies and, and investors, is that you have to really look at how do you do different types of models of collaboration 
right? So if everyone just goes off and has their own like girls in STEM programs or, or kind of looking at how do you build that pipeline of talent, you're probably not going to have as great an impact if you, you know, come together and really combine forces. So um, I think that's really just understanding, you know, where are those opportunities? And, and that's when you talk about what inspires me most about this work. It's, you know, some of the collaborations we've been able to do, you know, around targeting where do you lose you know, girls and women or, or it, along the pipeline. And so we've actually done some really interesting work with um, middle school girls um, in the U.S. And, and elsewhere, but really about that's where you might lose them in terms of loving science or, or loving technology and, and really making it about problem uh, solving uh, experience to get them engaged. And so we've done a really cool partnership with a number of foundations called the Million Girls Moonshot really to, and really a, a focus um, on you know, underserved uh, groups, you know, and, and really making sure that those um, opportunities are available. So I think also kind of what you're talking about is just about also that sponsorship engagement and, um, and personally, you know, that, that self-care is really, I think, important because one thing we've found through the pandemic, especially a lot of our employees continue to work, you know, and keep our factories open around the world. And then 90 percent that were working from home, a lot of you know, people with young families starts with everybody taking care of themselves first and showing that it's OK. And then I think really making sure that every person has individual challenges that have to be supported. So um, thank you, though, for all of your thoughts, because I feel like I got to go last, but you had already said most of the important things, I think, that we're all thinking about. It's it's, it's really uh, amazing the amount of, you know, uh, the initiative that you've taken and and this, the, and, and the, uh, the thought that you said that it's, it's about taking those right steps from the organizational standpoint as well to contribute to the growth of women and, you know, support them. Um, I mean, they, they do have their own struggles, but uh, when, it, when the organizations take those critical steps to support women in that uh, uh, space, that expedites uh, the progress. So, the, any uh, anything, any point that anybody else wanted to.